Thank you all for being here. Special thanks to the Governor's Commission on Women for the wonderful work you do and for co-sponsoring this session. And uh, it's, it's lots of fun for me to be here with, with uh, a number of people in the audience that, uh, that are friends and colleagues. Well, when I go to a dinner party and someone asks me what I do, I typically say, well, I research and teach about ethics. And about 80% of the time, I get exactly the same response, the same phrase. And here it is. Business ethics, isn't that an oxymoron? And then the person typically goes on to suggest to me that you can't teach ethics, that if people don't have ethics by the time they get out of second grade, you just can't teach it. And so uh, I'll have more to say about that later. But typically, there's also another problem that we need to be thinking about, and that is that many of those people who understood ethics in the second grade, who have the right values in the workplace, oftentimes act in ways that are not in sync with their values, and they end up doing bad things. So we have smart, successful, good people doing bad things. And the work I'm going to talk about today really focuses on that topic. And um, I'm going to tell you about some research, and I'm going to first begin with a couple of, of quotations that are like what we hear when we uh, go in and do interviews. Things like, it's unfortunate, but ethics is not a high priority. This line of questioning is so interesting because it's just never come up. Or something like this. Usually ethics is something that just doesn't seem to apply much. You just don't really think about it too much. Again, good successful people who end up making, making mistakes, making bad decisions. So I'm going to talk with you about uh, some research I did uh, on how advertising professionals see ethics. I did it with Patrick Murphy, who's here from Notre Dame. He's the co-director of Notre Dame's Institute for Global Ethics and happens to be here by serendipity to talk to the Austin Notre Dame Club tomorrow. So uh, about ethics, about ethics. So if I pass out, we've got backup here. Uh, at, at any rate, I'll tell you just a little bit about our, our method. We went into a number of advertising agencies in a number of major cities, and we talked to more than 50 advertising professionals about how they see ethics, how they think about ethics, and we also um, interviewed across the experience levels and throughout all the departments in the advertising agencies, and we promised anonymity and confidentiality so that people will feel free to speak to us candidly. The agencies varied in size. They included some uh, big, successful name brand agencies. And so after we got these transcripts, we analyzed them systematically and came up with themes. And one of the major themes was that a lot of people, a lot of these smart, successful people, just do not see ethical issues. Or if they see them, they just don't come clearly into focus. And we called this moral myopia where good, smart, successful people are just not focusing on the ethical issues or perhaps even being blind to them. And we found them at three levels. We found moral myopia at the level of the individual, at the level of the organization, and at the level of society. And I'd like to say a little bit about each of these levels. So at the individual level, we'd have a person who would perhaps say some things that would mis mislead a boss or a client into thinking things are going better than they are. But she, she just wouldn't be focusing on that deception. She'd be so busy doing her work that that just wouldn't seem to matter. Or someone who would, um, who would shift hours in reporting billable hours, shift them into the current quarter from a future quarter so that she would qualify for the bonus this quarter and wouldn't really see anything wrong with it, because after all, nobody's getting hurt. So we have these people who are just not focusing on the ethical issues, or who are so distracted by other things that they're just not paying attention to them. Which brings me to the, uh, to the organizational level. And here's how moral myopia might manifest itself at the organizational level. The organization has some policies or practices or some reward systems that really kind of encourage people to do some of these things that are unethical. But people aren't really seeing the connection between these policies and the bad behavior. They're just thinking of these policies as encouraging aggressiveness or, or 
productivity. Another form that moral myopia might take at the organizational level would be an individual who might say something like, I could never encourage other people to smoke. That's just wrong. I could never work on a tobacco advertising account. But they wouldn't see any conflict with the fact that their agency has a major tobacco account and much of the viability of the agency and much of the revenue that funds salaries and bonuses comes from this lucrative tobacco account. Now at the societal level, moral myopia is perhaps the hardest to spot. And here's the form it might take. Someone working in an advertising is aware of the fact that there's research that shows that, that images of women can be problematic, especially for young women, and especially those images that, that really hold up as, as beautiful women who are hyper thin, and these kind of images can, can lead to problems like anorexia and other de eating disorders. She knows this, but as she gets ready to select the models for the fashion account that she's working on for those ads, she doesn't see any connection between the model she picks and contributing to the, that larger societal problem. She's just so involved with trying to please the client and do great advertising that she's just not focusing on that issue. So moral myopia is a problem, but we found also another problem that contributes to it, and this is when people just don't talk about ethical issues. Scholars like Frederick Byrd and James Waters have called this moral muteness. And again, it's when people who might see, or see ethical issues just don't talk about them. Now, why is this a problem? Because if people aren't talking about ethical issues, then it's very difficult for them to be reflecting on them, perhaps as much as they should. It's difficult for other people to be aware of them and to be thinking about them. And people are much more likely, if they're morally mute, to just reinforce the moral myopia in themselves and others. So we see these two problems, moral myopia and moral muteness. Now, this raises the question of why do these smart, successful people pro fall prey to things like moral mu muteness and moral myopia? Well, the answer is not shocking. It's rationalizations. Rationalizations like what we use on our parents and teachers when we're young, on our bosses when we're older, they can work really well on ourselves. And this type of finding really converges with the findings of scholars who've worked on decision making in many, many contexts. Uh, some of their names are Kahneman, Tversky, Prentice. Robert Prentice has, has taken this, these kinds of biases and heuristics and written about them in the business ethics context. And when they're talked about and written about in business ethics, these decision-making biases and heuristics or shortcuts that lead us astray are called behavioral ethics. So these findings converge with, with those of, of other scholars. But what I'd like to do is talk with you a bit about the types of rationalizations that we found among these advertising professionals. And I think you'll see that they're not unique to people in advertising. So one of them is if it's legal, it's moral. Or if it's not illegal, it couldn't be immoral. And here's the way one of the informants, a CEO of a major advertising agency, here's what he said to me. I think advertising is probably one of the most ethical businesses there is. <laughs> it's so regulated. Everything that we do has to go through our lawyers to make sure it's conforming to the law and then to our clients' lawyers, and then we have to send it to the network and their lawyers. It's really hard to be unethical in this business, even if you tried. Now, you all know that advertising and all the polls of consumer trust, it comes in second to last. It only beats out used car salesmen. But <laughs> irrespective of what people think about advertising, uh, legal scholars and ethicists uh, assert that the law is the minimum and that it's oftentimes very insufficient in order to guide us with respect to ethical behavior. This type of thinking also means that you delegate all ethical decision making to attorneys. Now, uh, another, another rationalization, and again, these are patterns of rational, these were patterns, many people falling into these same patterns. Another was what we called um, going native, 
We got this term from anthropology. It's a term that anthropologists use to uh, indicate when someone who's gone out to study another culture becomes so immersed in that culture that he or she loses the ability to think critically about it. And this can happen in ethics. And the way it typically happens is that you uh, become so involved and so immersed in your company's goals or your client's goals or maybe your fraternity or sorority goals that you just lose sight of ethical issues. You're just not seeing the red flags. Another uh, pattern we call the ostrich syndrome. And again, this was when uh, people would just ignore ethical issues. They would just put their heads in the sand. As one person said, I think if I did a little digging on this client, then I think I'd have a problem working on it. So I just don't dig. I just really don't have time for that. And we all know that sticking your head in the, in the sand and ignoring ethical issues is, is really never a solution. Now, the next type of, um, of pattern is one that I think is particularly, particularly tricky. And I refer to it as competing goals. And what happens in this situation, in these types of situations, is that there's some goal that just seems so virtuous that it really trumps everything else even ethical issues. And though it sounds virtuous, when you get down and really start analyzing it, you see that there's very superficial thinking, thinking that really is problematic. So here's one example. The client is always right. You've got to please the client, right? As one of our informants said, you never say no to your client about something that involves ethics. That'd be like shooting yourself in the foot. So here we see a pleaseaholic approach to serving clients and very superficial reasoning that trumps ethical concerns. Another form this could take is maximizing shareholder wealth. That's, that's a virtue, right? That's what you're supposed to do. But it, it can also serve as a cover for unethical issues that, 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 and, and for unethical behavior that's clearly inappropriate. Now, a form that this took that is unique to advertising, perhaps, is what we call the First Amendment dodge. And here's the way it occurred to me first. Or here's the way I first saw it. The president of a major advertising agency was describing to me some of the issues that he had and some of the challenges. And I said, well, have you ever thought about having a code of ethics that would express to your clients and also to your workers the types of advertising messages that you're going to create? And he pushed back from his desk and said, how could we? That would abridge our clients' First Amendment rights. Now, my husband, who's a law professor, teaching First Amendment, hits the roof when he hears that because it's clearly a very distorted understanding of the First Amendment. The First Amendment precludes government from censoring speech. It doesn't at all prevent uh, speech professionals or citizens from speaking out against bad speech. In fact, the whole idea of a marketplace of ideas that the First Amendment is to support assumes that people are going to fight against bad speech, that they're going to speak up against bad speech. So even though the First Amendment uh, doesn't censor racist speech, that doesn't mean that it's acceptable. And we all would agree that we should speak up against speech like that. And, uh, and this guy, this, this professional, did not understand the First Amendment um, in the way it should be understood. So uh, another type of rationalization that, fit, that a number of people had, and another pattern was what we referred to as ethics is bad for business. And this sentiment was one that many people felt that if they were to bring up ethical issues to their colleagues or clients, that people would see them as not having business savvy, as not being people who were astute, hard-driving, productive business people. As one informant said, if I brought up ethical issues, people would say, hey, if you're going to do that, go run a church. And of course, there, there, there's lots of research that shows that bad ethics can be very bad for business. And, and we know that's very superficial thinking and very much against the idea of a trusted business advisor who's going to be bringing up these kinds of issues. Um, another pattern was what we referred to as the Pandora's box syndrome. And this is when people were just so worried about 
thinking about ethical issues and so worried that, that they'd be overwhelmed or they had to do something drastic that they'd just ignore them. As one person said, I think that if I did a little digging on this company, then I think I'd have a problem working on it. So I just don't dig. I don't really have time for that. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I read, I forgot to turn my page. And uh, Pandora's box is similar to the ostrich syndrome, but here it is. When you start looking for ethical issues, they're everywhere. You open a can of worms that just goes on and on. You could get so bogged down and wondering if what you're doing is right that you'd end up not doing anything at all. And of course, that's a very counterproductive perspective. Now, another rationalization is what we call compartmentalization. This is when, um, when people have one set of values for home and family and another place, another set for the workplace, and those two might conflict in a number of situations, but they just aren't paying attention to them. They're just not keenly attuned to this conflict. And we know that's likely to lead to problematic ethical issues. So again, these are just a few of the patterns, and, uh, and they were indeed patterns that, that a number of people evidenced, and they do converge with uh, findings of other people, other scholars, that, that these kinds of rationalizations and decision shortcuts can be problematic. Now, I want to pause in talking about our research and talk a little bit about an initiative here at the McComb School of Business that has gone a long way in helping us communicate effectively about these ideas, which can seem abstract and, um, and distant, especially if you're an undergraduate. It's called Ethics Unwrapped. It's a film series about these concepts that we teach in business ethics. And it's um, a couple of years old and has already done some amazing work. We've got Robert Prentice, the director, uh, Cara Biasucci, the uh, filmmaker, and her, uh, her, film, her co-filmmaker, Sonia Melendez, here today. And I'll show you some samples of their work. I've got to tell you also, if you teach business ethics, there are very few audiovisual materials available. Uh, people just haven't spent a lot of time building them. So these are unique. They're offered free for anyone, and they're already used extensively in this country and abroad. And uh, you can go to this website and look them over and, uh, and enjoy them yourselves. I want to show you how we use them to make them relevant to, or to make these concepts relevant to undergraduates. So remember when we talked about competing goals as a rationalization. I had a friend who did that for money at some point, wrote essays for other people. And, you know, I turned a blind eye to it because I know the right thing would be, oh, I should turn this in to the uh, disciplinary council or the omnibus person or somebody at the university. There's that gut feeling of, I know this is wrong, but they're my friend and I don't want to do anything <laughs> to hurt that friendship. I was trying to rationalize this, this is the, the higher good is that they are doing something to put themselves through school. Not thinking about, you know, the unethicalness of the person who's buying the paper, not actually earning their grades, or them messing up the system, or ruining the credibility of undergraduate students overall. The good goal of putting yourself through school trumps the problematic ethical issues related to writing essays for other people and selling them to them. And again, that's about a one minute clip from a, an eight or nine minute video. Uh, let's think about the idea of going native. And here we'll hear a young man talking about how he went native in his, in his fraternity. In one of the organizations I'm in here on campus, there is a very strong subculture that is not in line at all with what I feel like is the mission of our organization. I guess by the university's definition, there has been some hazing over the past couple of years. And I think that's despicable. We're open, we're about serving students, we're not about being exclusive and you know, being self-serving. It's difficult for me to speak up because these are my friends, one, and I don't want any harm to come to them. I value my relationships with these people and I don't want to affect those adversely. But it's also difficult because if the administration was to find out what we do, even if it's unofficial, um, that could lead to potentially our kicking off campus. And I definitely don't want to see that happen because that, I've, that's probably worse than the strong social subculture that's emerged in recent years.
In both these videos, you see what's often a theme, and that is my friends. I don't want to do anything that would hurt my friends, and that can be, um, you know, a superordinate uh, goal for undergraduates sometimes. Now, I remember the, the idea of moral mutinous generally. Here we'll hear a young man who talks about how he was aware of a problem uh, about a homework set, but he didn't bring it up, and he later regrets it and sees that he, that he should have, so he has moral muteness. So in my theater class last semester, it was, we had these take-home quizzes that we completed over Blackboard. The whole issue for me was, are you allowed to use your notes on this take-home exam when the teacher doesn't clarify whether or not she expects that you take this by yourself or not? So then that's where the rationalizations of ethics come in. Well, she knows if it's a take-home exam, then people are going to use their notes. She has to know that. I never stood up and asked, like in class, or I never stood up and emailed the professor, are we allowed to use notes on this? Because if she says yes, then it's a non-issue. But if she says no, then it becomes this ordeal. And I guess at the time, I didn't want to be that guy. You don't want to rock the boat. If you rock the boat too much, then you don't get to be in the boat anymore. They throw you out. So you can see how these videos make these issues very salient and relevant. To undergraduates. Um, as Cara mentioned, Ethics Unwraps has a number of series. One of them revolves around a 25-minute docu documentary on Jack Abramoff, whose name you probably remember. He was the super lobbyist who was convicted of many crimes and spent several years in the federal penitentiary. He came here to UT about a year and a half ago, and Cara and her team made a documentary, as well as some short clips that help explain some of these concepts. And I want to play one of those where Abramoff himself explains how compartmentalization between his personal values and his values that he put into play at work, how they led him to commit these very bad things. Um, and it also helps explain a concept called role morality, which is really based on compartmentalization, where you, you compartmentalize so that, so that you then play a role at work that you would refuse to play if you were, walking, if you were working uh, on your own agency as part of your personal life. Uh, I thought I was great. I thought I was moral. I, I thought, frankly, uh, we, had a, we had an approach to our clients that we weren't going to lose. They're paying us money, and the moral thing to do is to give them what they paid for. Role morality is the tendency that people have when they're in a job to say, oh, my personal ethical standards don't apply here because I'm playing the role of a lobbyist or an engineer or a politician. My faith uh, certainly doesn't uh, advocate uh, any of this kind of activity. Um, the Bible is very uh, uh, severe about bribery. He himself in his book writes about the fact that there were conflicts of interest that he was part of, essentially bribing legislators to get results. And he would do that during the day. At night, he would go home and he would read the Torah and he would read about how bribery was bad and should not be done. And he did not make that connection. Um, I would look at that, by the way, the Bible speaks about bribing judges, doesn't talk about legislators. So even when it came up, I would think, well, this isn't the same thing. I'm not bribing a judge. These aren't judges. Well, the truth is, our sages in the last couple hundred years, there weren't legislators, legislatures or legislators at the time of the Bible. I think he, he had what I call a compartmentalization. He had one set of values for his friends and family, his personal life, his religious life. He had another set for his um, work life. When he was playing the role of a lobbyist, I think he let ethical matters fall out of his frame of reference altogether. That was reserved for when he was at home at night reading the Torah. In the workplace, everything was win, win, win. I've got to win for my client. I thought other lobbyists who didn't do that, who didn't care whether their clients lost, lost or not, were the immoral lobbyists. And this is quite ironic, actually, uh, that I thought I was the moral lobbyist. So, in terms of my approach to this, uh, I didn't think anything was wrong. It's a lesson we all need to keep in mind, that if we don't look at ethical issues thoughtfully, if we're not reflective, we can make the same types of uh, terrible decisions that he made just as easily as he made them.
So you see how Ethics Unwrapped can be very helpful, not just with students, but also with professional audiences. You can see how it can be very helpful in online education, which we're moving more and more to these days. And I'll say a little bit more about Ethics Unwrapped later. But uh, now I'd like to get back to the research I was talking about and to the point where we paused to, to look at Ethics Unwrapped, it had really been a pretty discouraging story, a story of morally insensitive people. But there is some good news. That wasn't the complete story. There were people who were morally sensitive, people we called seeing, talking, advertising professionals. And they happened to be grouped together, clustered in agencies. So we went in and did even more interviews in those agencies. And here's some of what we found. We found that these people recognized ethical issues. They felt it was their job to recognize these issues. They said, we'd be embarrassed if a client saw an ethical issue and brought it up before we did. These agencies were characterized by communication, by lots of communication about lots of issues, including ethical issues, lots of talk about that. They felt that it was good to say no to clients. It was their job to say no to clients. You know, the morally myopic and morally buke people tended to be pleaseaholics. Their job was to please the client, whatever it took. These people did see themselves as trusted business advisors whose jobs included saying no, telling people things they wouldn't necessarily want to hear, but desperately needed to hear. They also, somebody had gone to the trouble of articulating the values and virtues for these organizations. So they were articulated, but that wasn't all. The values and virtues had been broadly embraced by a number of people there. So you had a community of people sharing the same values and virtues. And they had what we call moral imagination, a term coined by Patricia Her uh, Werhain and Mark Johnson. And here's the form it took. Uh, the first time I encountered it, and again, this was a pattern that we saw. Um, a major, a major a CEO, CEO of a major advertising agency, a very successful agency, a very famous person, told me about a situation in which he went in to a major client that counted for a big chunk of the agency's revenues, and the client asked him to do something he thought was unethical. He told the client he thought it was un unethical. He told him why. He also said, you know, we really think this is a bad idea. The client refused to hear his objections and said, I want you to go back and think about this. Let's meet again tomorrow, and I think you will have reconsidered, and you'll agree. So the CEO went back to his agency, talked with his colleagues. They all agreed that this was just a, a completely unacceptable action. They weren't willing to do it. He said he went back the next day and resigned right before he was, was fired. And uh, in many agencies, what happens when you lose a major account is that many, many people get their pink slips. They're fired, they're laid off, the agency needs to dramatically reduce its overhead quickly, so that's what has to happen. This man felt that that too was an irresponsible behavior. So he got everybody together, he said, let's think of some ways, let's brainstorm what we could do. So they found some ways to dramatically cut costs in the short term, to pitch new business, they were able to uh, find a way to be both ethical and successful. And that's what moral imagination entails, thinking outside the box so you find ways to be both ethical and successful that some people can't see, that some people can't just imagine. And as I was alluding to earlier, we had a community here of people who cared about ethical issues, who thought that people should be talking about them and acting on them and philosophers from Aristotle to our own Paul Woodruff here at UT have written exp extensively on the importance of community in living ethically. Uh, Paul Woodruff recently has written a book called Reverence, and here's what he wrote about community and virtues. Virtues grow in us through being used, and they're used mainly by people living or working together. If you're surrounded by vice, you will find it hard to stay in tune with virtue. Virtue ethics, then, deals with strengths that people develop in communities. Communities, in turn, depend upon the strengths of their members. And he also wrote, virtues are cultivated over time, and they have the greatest lasting power in close-knit communities. So I think that, that uh, this research 
really points to the importance of having people around us who share our values, who are talking about them, who are thinking with us about them, who are encouraging uh, moral behavior. And if you're not lucky enough to have that type of people at your work, then you need to surround yourself with friends and family who share your values that you're in conversation with. Now, I'd like to move from this into another question that draws on another research project, and I'll be quicker in talking about this, but I'd like to address the question of why and how people can influence their organizations to act ethically. And I'm going to talk about a study that I did with a former PhD student, Marlene Neal, and it's on public relations professionals and how they can serve as organizational conscience or ethics counselors within their organizations. We're talking about PR people, but I think you'll see that what we found has some relevance for anybody working in an organization. And so when you think about what an organizational conscience is, it's someone who raises concerns when his or her organization's actions might bring about troubling consequences to various parties inside or outside. So we're oftentimes talking about uh, issues where, moral, where organizational myopia organizational moral myopia could come into play. And this person uh, certainly is concerned with issues of the law, but also with issues that extend beyond the law to encompass the spirit of the law, or that the law doesn't potentially address. So this is what uh, scholars have defined as an organizational conscience. And uh, why public relations? Why would we want to study them? Well, a number of scholars and practitioners both have suggested that public relations people are in a very unique position to provide this count, kind of counsel. Certainly, they're the person you see when there's a crisis that has ethical dimensions. They're the voice and face of the organization. But also, they have boundary-spanning responsibilities in which they're trying to understand external stakeholders, the customers, but other key parties in the community outside the organization. And they're trying to analyze the consequences of the organizations actions on these external stakeholders and trying to communicate about these issues and respond to them in responsible ways. So they're in a position where they could do this, but the research has shown that despite the fact that leaders in, in the profession and scholars have argued that they should be doing this and that they're in a unique, unique position to do this, the research shows that many of them don't. In fact, there's a famous article called The State of Neglect of the Organizational Conscience. And so uh, Marlene Neal and I wanted to go into to companies and understand how the people who did this successfully, who successfully played the role of organizational conscience, how they did it. And so the, the method is similar to what we did, like, what I told you about with the other study. We went into companies and nonprofits and government agencies and talked to 30 chief public relations officers. and. Uh, we also screened them for people who believed that, um, that PR people should be playing this role of ethics counselor or organizational conscience. They didn't have to have played it successfully, but they needed to believe that, that it should be played. And, um, and then we promised anonymity and um, confidentiality again. And so the findings I'm going to, pre going to present now are what we found from the people who played this role effectively and successfully. And what we found was that they had a very interesting and distinct conception of their role in the organization. They had dual loyalties. They certainly had loyalties to their organization, but also to the public interest. And they were just as passionate and just as strong in their speaking about the loyalty and what the loyalty to the public interest meant as they were in speaking about their loyalty to the organization. They viewed themselves as being an independent voice. That's what their job was, to be an independent voice. And because public relations people are often staff people reporting to, sen to senior leaders, they weren't ensconced in some function, typically, like, like marketing or finance or accounting. So they, they felt that they were more independent than many executives. And they also had their personal credibility on the line. They were the ones who had to be the face of the organization in a crisis, so this gave them skin in the game. Interestingly, they did not conceive of their roles as communication. Instead, they thought of their roles as problem solvers, as consultants, and this was their modus operandi. How can I solve problems? How can I consult with this organization? 
None of them had ethics in their job description, but they all saw ethics as very key to what they were supposed to do, to what their job was, and to what their professional identity was. And they were, as you might imagine, oftentimes in the unenviable position of giving unwelcomed information to supervisors. And so I had imagined, since these people were professional communicators, that they'd be great debaters, they'd be great preachers, they'd be great arguers. But that was a surprising finding. They did not communicate as preachers or teachers or evangelists. Instead, they were very resourceful in using experiential approaches to communication that let other people think through the situation and really come to their own conclusion that the unethical approach was problematic. So what kinds of things did they do? One example was a mock news conference where they would set up a news conference and have the, uh, the executives, the leaders, play through a scenario so they could see how the unethical behavior could potentially blow up in their face. Or they'd use the headline test where they would show what the potential headlines about the unethical behavior might be so that people would be hit in the face by the possible ramifications. Then they also would do something like write a speech two ways. One way that they felt was unethical and irresponsible, another way that was ethical and responsible so the senior leader herself could see that she needed to do the responsible ethical way. So again, very resourceful, very adept at communication. They also played the devil's advocate very well, which you know gives you a chance to take an impartial kind of position, or at least that you're not arguing your own position. You're saying, what if? So that to help these folks communicate in ways that were not preachy or judgmental. They didn't act like they were snack <clears throat> slapping hands, but instead you know, trying to be helpful and think through the situation. They had moral imagination. They were very good at coming up with ethical alternatives that would be responsible, that could replace what had been um, suggested to them. Now, for anybody who's trying to play this role, you need access to the important people. You've got to be able to get your ideas up there. And we all immediately think of being asked to the big important conference table where you're with the senior leaders. But that oftentimes doesn't happen, or at least in the case of PR people, they're called in late after a crisis has already happened. So what was so remarkable about these people is that they were very adept at understanding and getting into what we call the informal power coalition, which are all the informal ways that people influence what's going on in the organization. Maybe it's through a task force, maybe it's through just having a relationship with somebody who's important and who's looked to for, for co consultation on an issue. But they were very adept organizational politicians and they would form relationships with key leaders and have ways of having a um, conversation with those leaders at important times. And uh, they also, the way they got into this uh, informal power coalition was also, was often by demonstrating how literate they were about the business and about what was going on. And just by really understanding their businesses. So they weren't communications people who were grafted onto an organization. They really understood the business dynamics. And that's how they would earn this kind of informal access. Now, all of us have barriers to playing this role or any other role of influence we'd like to play. And it's important to understand what those barriers are for you as you try to be organizational conscience. And for the PR people, it oftentimes involved executives who didn't really understand PR, who thought it was just about writing what you were told and getting it out. So they had to educate these folks. Uh, there also was this encroachment of marketing where people were trying to see PR as just a subset of marketing and not in its broader role of understanding stakeholders and what's going on with respect to stakeholders beyond the customer. I've referred to this kind of sole focus on customers as the new marketing myopia where it just, the focus on customers blinds all the other issues and all the other stakeholders. So again, it's important for all of us to understand and try to mitigate the barriers in the organization to our providing influence. So this brings up the question of how can we nurture business professionals? And I think it's important that we try to 
try to get people to see that they have a dual role, a dual loyalty, that they've of course got to be loyal to, loyal to the organization, but they also must be loyal to the, to the public interest. I think we need to help them see that ethics is a key part of their role as a professional. It's a part of the professional identity. And we want them to develop communication skills that enable them to be adept at communicating their ideas without seeming preachy or judgmental, those experiential, resourceful approaches. And they need, of course, to have moral imagination to see the ethical alternatives and uh, they've got to be great politicians. They've got to be not just great communicators, but great politicians to, to get access, or adept politicians, so that they can access these informal coalitions. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to turn to uh, some research of uh, someone else. And it really raises the question of how can we increase the likelihood that we will act in sync with our values? And so this really raises the question, when we know what we want to do, how can we increase the likelihood that we'll live in sync with our values? And I'll be drawing on the research of Mary Gentile, and she's written a book called Giving Voice to Values, How to Speak Your Mind When You Know What's Right. She also has a curriculum website. A number of us have contributed cases. In fact, a young Ah Song is here, one of our PhD students, who has worked with me to write cases and teaching notes about ethical scenarios that are used. And the focus of this, again, is how do you do what you want to do? Once you decide what you want to do, how do you move forward to it, to do it? And Mary asserts that a whole lot of the issues that we face, we know what's right. We don't need to go into sophisticated analysis to understand that we shouldn't be lying to a client. But how do we develop the ability to do what we, th what we ought to do? And she talks about various levers that we uh, can have to increase our power and influence and create, cr increase the likelihood that we'll know what to say and to whom to say it to. So this is kind of a post-decision-making approach. When you know what you want to do with respect to ethics, what do you do? And she advises to frame the situation in the long run rather than the short run so you'll see what's really at stake and to consider the organization's wider purpose, which usually does not involve acting unethically. And to uh, watch out for false dichotomies, like assuming that you either have to be unethical and make a lot of money, or be ethical and go broke. Look for ways to both be successful and ethical. She argues that you need, as you talk to people about these things, to position yourself as an agent of continuous change. You need to have moral imagination and provide actionable alternatives. She also says find allies, don't try to do it alone. Point out the cost to various parties. Oftentimes, unethical behavior has lots of hidden costs. And if you look at what's happening to the overall system as people give false information and that information moves into the next quarter and the quarter after that, there can be some real problematic costs that are not easily apparent initially. Point to these addictive cycles. If you cheat this month in your hours reported, you'll probably have to shift more hours in the future. So oftentimes, ethics leads to a slippery slope, or, um, or unethical behavior leads to a slippery slope, or addictive cycles. Use your most persuasive arguments, just like you'd use in other contexts. And. Um, one thing that I, I want to mention, I, I know at, at this point in time, uh, I may have perhaps sounded like uh, a little bit of a Mary Sunshine with uh, these kinds of, of, um, of suggestions. I know they can be really hard to do. Uh, one of the brilliant parts of Mary Gentile's approach, I think, is that uh, she points out that, that oftentimes these unethical temptations are not make or break the company kinds of things. It could be something like, a manager who refuses to cover for a coworker's dishonesty, or an employee who refuses to lie uh, when, when the, to the customer when the boss asks him or her to. So even these kind of situations, these day-to-day -day situations take courage. And we can have the best values in the world, but if we don't have the courage to put them in, in, into action, they really don't do anyone any good. So when you think about uh, ways to en enable courage, 
Uh, there are a number of, of ways and things one can do, and in fact, Ethics Unwraps has a, a, a series on giving voice to values and on these kinds of levers and things that one can do to enable courage. Uh, for example, what we mentioned earlier, having a like-minded network of people who also share your values, who will be encouraging you to act ethically and talking with you about that, uh, understanding what's truly at stake, you know, really looking at the big picture, uh, understanding when something is all untenable, when the alternative really is not acceptable, focusing on the possibility of positive change and on the possibility of yourself being that agent of positive change, and then forgiving yourself of your mistakes. We all make mistakes. Forgive yourself of your mistakes. Recognize them. Forgive yourself of the mistakes. Learn from them so that you can then move on and avoid them. And really key to this approach is the idea of pre-scripting yourself, which involves practicing. So we have many scenarios in the classroom that, that raise typical issues that someone might face as a student intern, as a professional, and we have people practice again and again in advance, recognizing these issues, thinking about what they do, the arguments they'd make, what they do if their for first course of action does not succeed, what's the backup plan. So cases like what Young, uh, Young Ah Song and I have written and others have, um, have really contributed to this Giving Voice to Values curriculum that is also offered for free and used around the world to help people develop these scripts so they're not caught unaware so that when they encounter ethical issues, it's not the first time they've thought about what they ought to do about them. And so this brings us to a question that I raised earlier, and that is, uh, can you teach business ethics? And oftentimes what we do in the classroom is not so much try to teach people right from wrong, though we do address those topics, but we're trying to help people spot the issues, start talking about the issues, think about them more systematically, and really learn ways to script themselves on how they'll go about putting their values into action so that they will have the satisfaction of knowing that they're living in sync with their values and aware of all the potential problems that can come from things like moral myopia, moral muteness, and those rationalizations that accompany them. So that's uh, what I had intended to present, and I, I'd love to answer questions. I've got lots of people here like Pat Murphy and Robert Prentice who can help me with the really hard questions, and uh, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Yes? I got a question uh, regarding your first video yes. when you talked about, uh, or the lady talked about what I didn't turn somebody in for violation of ethical behavior. Well, 20 years ago, I was in business school here, and there used to be an honor code. There was what? An, an, honor, an honor code, you know, that you don't oh, yes, cheat. Yes. And one of the sentences said, you know, I promise to turn somebody in if I see cheating. Okay, the honor code said that you yeah, needed exactly. to turn someone in. Yeah, exactly. And I refuse that. So coming from a country where in the past, you know, people got turned in for behavior, I think turning people in opens a can of worms. Okay, so I'd like to get your opinion on when is it right or wrong to turn somebody in for what you believe is unethical behavior. Well, that's the, the whole question of whistleblowing. And I would argue that uh, when there's a public interest in turning in the person, when you analyze the stakeholders and see that much is at stake, like for example, if cheating is going on systematically, I would argue a lot is at stake. The uh, university's whole approach to learning is at stake. Our whole credibility is at stake. The it's, it's unfair to students who aren't cheating. I would say in that situation, there are many uh, stakeholders and many people who would be affected negatively by systematic cheating if it goes on unchecked. And that, um, you know, there are ways to report that cheating in such a way that perhaps you're not um, risking harm to yourself. There are anonymous hotlines. There are uh, ways to tip professors off. So I would hope, I hope that what we're teaching people is, that, or what we're encouraging people to think about is how in a situation like that you might be able to 
confront the cheater, to uh, tip off a professor, to let a TA know, a teaching assistant know that something problematic is happening, that something needs to change. Maybe it's the monitoring of the test situation that needs to be stricter. Or, so, I, so I think that if, if I think that, that um, companies, organizations in general have a real, a lot at stake in terms of trying to create a situation, a context in which it's safe for people to voice concerns and to voice um, issues like that. Because you're assuming that I do know the public interest. Well, I it's think not a kind of an interesting view that I claim to know that. How do I know that? So I think there's a difference between me acting ethical on my own part and having the hybrids, the arrogance to turning people in for what I believe is unethical. I think that's a very dangerous concept. Well, I think that if, if people are being uh, personal, if they're acting out of personal revenge or something like that, then perhaps there are impure motives. But the situation you described is blatant cheating. And if blatant cheating goes on unchecked, then the people who aren't cheating are disadvantaged. The university is disadvantaged. There are many, so I would, I would think that, that that's a situation where one could think carefully, am I just being petty and jealous and arrogant, or am I really trying to uh, do something that's important? And, uh, and maybe the thing that you ought to do first is talk to the cheater, talk to the person who's writing papers and selling them, and try to get that person to see that this is, this is a very dangerous thing for her. I've had actually many situations of students who tell me about situations like that where they didn't intervene because they defined friendship as not stopping somebody from doing what they wanted to do or not crossing them. And then later, if the person's caught, they say, oh, I only, if I'd only known, I really misunderstood friendship. If I had been a true friend, I would have tried to get her to stop doing that before she was caught. So I think one uh, thing that we often talk, talk with undergraduates about is what does it really mean to be a friend? Does it, mean to, that, does it really mean letting your friend cheat and make an A that way? Or does it mean trying to get that person to stop so that he or she is not caught? And uh, doesn't suffer those consequences. But I think in, in whistleblowing, one always has to think, am I being petty or jealous and arrogant, or am I really dealing with something where there's a public interest and where something important's at stake? And I think all of us would argue that, that uh, cheating in, in many contexts is, is a real issue that's uh, problematic for uh, the people who are not cheating, if it's a company for competitors who are trying to do it right, the free enterprise system is based on trust, and if, if people, if companies are cheating uh, prolifically, then trust breaks down. So, but I, but it is hard. I think that's one of the hardest things: trying to, you know, turn, turning a friend, confronting a friend, or turning a friend in. Yes. Um, I have a few questions. Um, one of which is is sort of related there. The my basic research question is: I'm curious as to whether or not you've spoken to or worked with any of the service academies. Um, they have a very strict honor code, zero tolerance policy, but they also have uh, a fairly detailed program that goes through the four years where through case method and others they, um, they work with the cadets um, to help them understand the importance of the code of ethics. So that's, that's question number one. Question number two sort of relates to um, what he was saying, what I guess to use your vernacular, um, what I would describe as cultural compartmentalization. Um, so the idea that uh, bribery um, is a crime and is immoral in the United States does not necessarily apply uh, in other international uh, realms where in fact bribery, by way of example, um, is not only um, deemed to be in the normal course of business but is often um, expected. And also, obviously in, in the business world uh, that's becoming much more international um, people at senior levels or even at regional levels have to make very difficult decisions about um, the ethical culture in which they were raised and the ethical culture in which uh, they are conducting um, business. And then similarly along those lines, um, I guess from a vertical perspective, at what point does something become the sort of the, the opposite of the slippery slope, I guess, where you fall deeper? At what point does something um, rise to the level um, at which um, someone needs to uh, say something. Okay. 
To your first question about the military academies, I have not personally worked with the military academies, but uh, Professor Howard Prince is on our faculty, and he was previously the chair of the Department of Psychology at West Point. And he was a big part of the ethics initiative there, as well as a big part of uh, thinking about how to reform the U.S. Army after Vietnam, how to reform a lot of its actions that, that uh, were, I would say, evidences of organizational myopia where they weren't seeing how certain practices were really encouraging uh, bad behavior. And we've learned a lot from him. He's very much a part. He's one of the advisors for Ethics Unwrapped. He's very much a part of our campus-wide ethics initiatives and has, has helped us immensely and brought in others who've been part of that, some of whom have been stationed here as ROTC officers. So we, we've benefited a lot from the military academies and what they've been doing. And, and we've been communicating what we've been doing to them, too. Uh, in, in, in terms of your other question, of course, that, that is a, a very difficult question. My colleague, Kate Gillespie, who studies bribery in developing countries, tells me that bribery is against the law most places. It's just that it happens. And you know, I think that um, one needs to think long and hard before one participates in that kind of activity. We have had people from places like um, Pier 1, Marvin Gerard, who comes and tells us he was the chief operating officer and then the CEO. I've lost touch with him. I'm not sure if he's still there or not. But he would come and talk about how they um, negotiate those issues and, uh, and, and, and don't participate in bribery. So I think that, that um, well, that's a complicated question and it's hard to give a across-the-board answer. I think oftentimes it's easy just to fall prey to the rationalization of social proof. Everybody does it. We've got to do it. And just be blind to the real problems you're perpetuating when you do that. So maybe one of the others in the room who's an expert would, would want to talk about uh, that. In Washington, so basically you have institutionalized bribery in this country. So what's the difference to bribing a poor guy in India who sells tickets so you can get on the bus, right? Whereas also institutionalized in different form. So I believe, uh, I agree with you, I think culturally speaking, uh, it is a very slippery slope to define what it is or what isn't. Particularly if you sit in a glass house yourself, you know. Well, the, the U.S. Justice Department doesn't see the slope as, as slippery or as unclear as what some of Yeah, but that's some of other countries say. would say it's arrogance on the U.S. to define uh, what bribery is and having its own form of bribery. So that, that's the point, no. right? You have concepts of where you are where you may disagree. Like I said before, turning in people for unethical behavior um, maybe in a country like Germany where I'm from may raise some red flag given our past and it may be totally okay here because in this country turning in people has not been a big issue. So I think the cultural difference is important when you talk about ethics. Well cultural difference is important, that's true, but, uh, but you seem to be arguing for a relativistic kind of stance and, and most of us would, would agree that, that everything is not relative, that that there are some situations where people ought to be turned in for bad behavior irrespective of the culture and you have to think carefully about the long-term effects of the bad behavior. And, and not to dominate the conversation, but um, to, to that point, um, you know, even within American culture, you, you know, I think most people in here drive. Um, most people in here that drive would say drinking and driving is bad, yet some people do it. Um, most people understand that driving and texting is dangerous. Uh, and now it's outlawed, but some people do it. Um, and then also people understand that speeding is illegal. Um, and I would defy anyone in this room to raise their hand and say they don't speed. So in other words, the, even when there are laws in place, um, there are ethical standards that culturally we come to understand as potentially dangerous and not dangerous. Um, and I think understanding that both within our own cultures and with regard to other cultures becomes important. And then secondly, um, there's a point at which, um, again, to, to your earlier point, where you have to make balances between um, getting business done um, and getting business done ethically. And I think within the confines of a particular culture, it becomes easier to do that. I think um, when you extend that culture to others, there's the danger um, that you're being seen as sort of arrogant or preachy 
or what have you. But at the end of the day, um, products get made, things have to get sold, costs. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's a, it's a dilemma. It's not an easy question to answer, but I think it's a question. Well, to your earlier point, the fact that people still text and drive or drink and drive doesn't make it right or undangerous. And we see the Texas Department of Transportation and many of our students working with them to come up with social marketing campaigns to try and approaches to try to persuade people to not text, not drink and drive. So just because some people accept it uh, doesn't mean that it's right or that we shouldn't try to change the culture. And I do think in many cases when we're talking about business ethics, we're talking about changing the culture. And that's hard. And when I get discouraged about culture changing, I think about smoking. Because you can all tell I'm old enough to remember when lots of people smoked. I was the only copywriter who didn't smoke in the first advertising agency where I worked. And now you can't smoke in an advertising agency in Austin, um, you know, in the building. So, you know, that's cultural change. I think oftentimes with these hard issues like bribery, like um, drinking and driving, we've got to keep working for culture change. And in as much if, as we say in kind of an indifferent manner, well, that's just the way it is. You know, because of World War II, we can't blow the whistle on anybody in Germany. Then that's, you know, that's really defeatist behavior. And, and there oftentimes are ways with moral imagination to figure a way to be both ethical and successful. And our speaker series here at the um, University of Texas and at the Macomb School and at the Moody College of Communication oftentimes bring in speakers who've done just that, who demonstrate that. When we brought Jack Abramoff in, he talked about how he's working in very clever ways to try to reform the lobbying system. And so I think we, it's, it's uh, important not to look at things that don't work as well as we wish they did and say, well, that just proves that we have license not to do what we think we ought to do in many contexts. So that's just um, you know, the way I think we need to work against the natural tendency to, to say, uh, you know, those things happen, we just have to put up with them. I think that's a defeatist attitude. Yes? Up, up here. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, how, how does your work, you know, how, how do you look at Phil Zimbardo's work, you know, around the Lucifer effect where he talked about institutional culture and role expectations changing people's ethics? you know, insidiously over time. Well, I have to confess, I have not read his work, yep. but I, I do think that's what happens in this organizational moral myopia, where systems and policies get in place that have some perverse effects, incentives that, uh, that prompt people to act unethically. And if you don't really think carefully about them, if you don't redesign them, try to bring about change, then you're right, you can have a culture that really reinforces bad behavior and, and gives people incentive for it. Got it. And that's why we have management scholars who really study these kinds of issues, systems, policies, practices, culture, climate. Yes? Did you come to a conclusion as to whether men or women are more ethical? We did not. We did not come to that conclusion. Um, our study wasn't designed to determine that. We did actually find that there were no differences in the second study in the way, and this is a different kind of breakdown, in the way people in companies versus uh, government versus nonprofits played the role of ethical conscience. So, you know, we did look for differences. We didn't see any differences on gender in, in either study. We, we didn't see any systematic differences uh, related to size of agency or city, any of those things. But again, we weren't really, our study wasn't designed to ferret out those kinds of things. But we did look for them. Uh, yes. <laughs> My question may be a rationalization, but uh, is there such a thing as being excessively ethical or in <laughs> ethics? Is there, is it always more is more? Well, you know, I, um, I, I guess one could argue that, um, that one might get so um, involved in ethics that they'd never do anything, but we really haven't seen that in our studies. And, uh, and I do think that, that when people, we do see some evidence that when people 
uh, feel empowered, that they're able to live out their values, live in sync with their values, that they uh, are satisfied and happy. Again, our study has not been specifically designed to do that, but uh, other studies that I've done uh, have suggested and have found that when people uh, feel like they're able to be themselves at their organization, they develop what one of our scholars here at Janet Dukrich has termed organizational identification, where they identify with their organization, they feel like the organization has the same fine characteristics they do, and so that's through a very robust set of research studies that's been found to provide lots of benefits to the individual, like satisfaction with the job, to the organization, like people staying longer, not missing as many days, providing more energy for other assignments that aren't their specific job. Uh, so, so that's been found to, uh, you know, to be a real benefit of uh, people living in terms of their values in an organization that reinforces that. I think, I, I think that, uh, that that would, what would you all say? More ethics is better? Yeah, okay, one more question? Yes. I was just curious about um, business practice business practice and environmentalism, and if you looked into that at all, where there might be places, you could talk as simply as recycling and whether or not a business does it, or um, wasted transportation where someone's flown across the world for one meeting or something like that, and whether or not that was taken into account in the study, or just kind of your general opinion on that in ethics. Yeah, I, I did do a, a, a big study on how people thought about um, organizational buying that had the environment as, as a non-economic criterion. And, um, and it was a, a, a study that uh, told me a lot about how organizations adopt that kind of practice. It also suggested that organizations oftentimes have, have blind spots. They'll be real attuned to one issue of environmentalism where people are scrutinizing them and not so attuned to another, so there are blind spots. But, um, one of the interesting findings from that study was uh, what I've termed a corporate social policy entrepreneur, somebody who has the same, um, the same characteristics as a new business entrepreneur. There are probably some in this room, people who are energetic, who have a huge commitment to a certain sort of policy that they want the institution to adopt, people who, who uh, assume career risk to get that adopted and who are just um, you know, with a new business entrepreneur's zeal, entrepreneur zeal in getting that implemented. So those, the key to uh, environmentalism in the, the context that I looked at, which were all companies, was having these policy entrepreneurs who were leading the charge. They were oftentimes middle managers. Um, they oftentimes got the support of senior management. I'd expected senior managers to be the ones leading the charge, but they don't have much credibility. <laughs> They're viewed as having the change program per, de, you know, per de jour, and, uh, and so the people who were very successful in instituting these environmentally sustainable practices were these, these policy entrepreneurs who just worked zealously as smart politicians to get others to work with them and, and agree with them. And they typically would demonstrate that this could be done in a pilot project in an area that wasn't highly scrutinized, so they had the freedom to do what they wanted to do, and then they got it spread. What's that again? Do you see not taking on an environmental policy that's pretty straightforward, like one of these examples, as unethical, or is it not in your mind as much as an ethical thing? Well, I think it's 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 uh, it's clearly irresponsible not to be using. I would say that that um, you know it's irresponsible not to be using resources wisely, and that that certainly is in the realm of what what we what people thinking about and talking about with respect to business ethics, how you operate your business responsibly and sustainably is, you know, about citizenship, certainly. So we certainly talk about those kinds of things in our business ethics classes. Okay, thank you very much. What a great audience. <laughs>